Within Anglochek, Kyrgyzstan, there is an open area filled with dead bodies of animals that don't decompose, and when people find themselves here, they reportedly begin to experience dizziness, nausea, pain in their teeth, head, and their stomach. Compasses, watches, and other equipment would malfunction, which made it difficult to study what would happen here. Within the Tian Shan Mountains resides a place named the Shaitan Mazar, otherwise known as the Grave of the Devil. This is where the story we're talking about today takes place. Towards the end of the Soviet Union, UFO sightings spiked just a little bit. At least in terms of popularity, you know, uh, the Voronezh UFO incident, that one CIA report of soldiers turning into stone after a UFO encounter, just to name a few. Also, since we're talking about the fall of the Soviet Union, I would just like to say, USA, USA, USA. That's all. Anyways, here's the story of the Shaitan Mazar UFO. On August 28, 1991, shortly before 5 p.m., an extremely large object about 600 meters long and 110 meters wide, I assume, I didn't write wide, was caught on radar screens in the Soviet Union over the Caspian Sea. Object moved at about 6,300 miles per hour at an altitude of 21,000 feet. Tracking operators issued a friend or foe request, received nothing, and labeled it as an intruder. The nearby cosmodrome at the Cap Pustin Yar was contacted asking for potential test flights and they also had the object on their radar. Operators at the Magislak Peninsula issued a military alert. Two MIG fighters were diverted from routine mission while two others rushed in from the peninsula. They were ordered to force it to land and if it didn't, they'd have to shoot it down. The object was met and seen in visual range over the Aral Sea. Another friend or foe request was given which got no response again and the object seemed to not care for the MIG surrounding it. And once the pilots got closer to the object, they noticed a long metallic gray object, two portholes towards the front, and green symbols believed to be of an unknown language. While they kept up with it, an emergency meeting was called in order to decide what action to take. High ranking of officers had said to just shoot it, <laughs> just shoot your shot bro, and decided to fire a warning shot on its path. Just as the shots were taken, there were no response from any of their controls, electrical systems didn't work, cockpit controls didn't work, and yes, I realize I just said cock, and their engines began to sputter. The object then pulled away from the planes, the pilots were then radioed to get back to the base and drop the chase, although radars on the ground kept tracking the object, watching it zigzag back over the Aral Sea. The object's speed was calculated at 42,000 miles per hour and it approached civilian airspace. Flight controllers at Magic Slack had notified Air Force and civilian personnel that an unidentified craft was traveling through the area and it posed a serious threat of colliding with other crafts. Then, about 45 minutes after the object's appearance, it just fucking vanished off the radar screens. Military personnel were said to be relieved, however, this brought numerous discussions and questions like what is its purpose, what's the origin, or were they just, you know, as the kids say these days, fucking retarded. However, by the end of September, rumors spread of a large object that had crashed in the mountains of the Shaitan Mazar. Residents of the village around Karakol were witnesses to said object. These rumors were genuinely so big, an entire expedition was formed to make a dangerous trip into the deep forest to find the object itself. Anton Bogatov, a respected researcher, led the expedition which consisted of experienced mountain climbers, locals, and members of the Russian UFO group Sakfon. I hope that's how you pronounce that. Don't worry, this time I looked for the pronunciation of stuff, because I had enough time. Me having time? That's amazing. That never happens. Hopes were high, obviously, and the group traveled for two weeks through the mountains without finding anything. They decided the crash must have happened at the other end of the Sarijaz River, and, you know, they went there. More rumors were spread to the group that said several locals had found the crash site, but they were burned and their watches had malfunctioned. Not gonna lie, this gave some bad juju to the crash site to the locals, so of course researchers wanted to go fucking find it here. Heavy snow warned of an avalanche and borderline death, and for two more weeks they kept going and once again found nothing. So with now suffering from frostbite and exposure, they finally turned back to their base camp. 
Their mission failed, like straight up. However, the saxophone group received a report that the Russian Air Force had found a crash site in November 1991. The higher ups in the Russian government got pretty interested in the UFO crash site story going around, especially after what happened in August that year. They believed it could have been the same craft. The report says while they tried to pull the object out of the snow covered bank, the helicopter crashed and killed everyone aboard. The Air Force stated that they would not attempt to retrieve the craft until spring. And this is what they did for Sacophone though. With this new information, they planned another trip, but they had planned to beat the government to the crash site, or else this finding would be hidden from the public. To avoid failure in the second attempt, more preparation was planned. Retired Major German G. Sveshkov was brought in to lead the group along with volunteers, all who were chosen for their particular expertise. All members were trained mentally and physically, requiring to pass plenty of tests, including physical endurance and survival training. Major Sveshkov split the members into three groups. The plan was to take three different routes, all similar, in case one group had to turn back. The idea was that at least one group would be successful in bringing back evidence of a UFO having crashed. The group was set to make the journey on June 1992, setting up a base camp about one and a quarter mile from the supposed crash site. The first path was on the north face of the mountain itself. The plan was for the groups to search the surrounding area of the crash site to search for any anomalies in case the stories of radiation hazards were real. According to the story, in the middle of June, they found it. They found an immense object broken in two and still emitting some type of energy field from it. Expedition member Emil Bakkerin had been quoted saying, You could feel it all around. Although the crew was still a great distance from the craft, their devices started to malfunction at about a thousand meters from the craft itself. The electromagnetic field around the craft was so intense that compass needles were drawn towards it and other measuring devices died. The crew reported a sense of dread and anxiety which then turned into immense fatigue and once they got closer they realized how the crash happened. It apparently crashed into a fucking cliff and that most likely caused an internal explosion that broke it in two. The energy field was too intense for the crew. This led to planned measurements and tests to be cancelled in favor of visual observation. Even power generators would burn up when started, although some small experiments were able to be done. The nose of the craft had been dented from the impact and the midsection had blown out the metallic cover, making it bend outward. The crew could not go any closer than 800 meters from the craft due to the energy field stopping them. However, sketches were made by observations. Even at 800 meters of distance, some of the crew members had gotten radiation burns. A glimpse of the inside of the craft could be seen from the blown out midsection, revealing beams and flooring, which implied that there could be more than one level inside, and also no bodies could be seen, so no aliens so far. The green symbols were large enough to be studied and were copied by Nikolai Subotin, and everyone agreed it didn't match any loan language. The crew confirmed without a doubt that this was the exact craft that had been chased by the MIGs, so pictures were taken, but due to the radiation field, they were overexposed and it ruined most of the valuable pieces of evidence that they had. Even videotapes were ruined as the cameras couldn't work once close enough to the craft itself. Like, they were genuinely so close, they, they had it right there and science just kind of said, Oh! It's the direction you can fuck! What was also seen was an Mi-8 helicopter that was most likely the one that crashed after trying to receive the UFO itself. It's believed that the energy field caused the helicopter's instruments to be disabled and led to a crash. And like I said prior, they were so fucking close, dude, it's actually kind of fucked. According to the story, they had actually seen a crashed UFO. On one hand, they failed in getting evidence. But on the other hand, the expedition was successful. The fucking found it. So they obviously kept the desire to see the inside of the craft, so a couple of months later, a third expedition was planned. The third expedition took a whopping six years to receive funding and to actually happen, only for it to fail. In 1998, Oleg Murashev, Nelly Slugina, Anton Bogatov, Nikolai Subotin, Alexei Kostenko, and Emil Bakarin all set out to make the trip one more time. I'm not Russian. 
probably butchered the fuck out of those names. Major Shvechkov was sought after to lead the group again but couldn't be contacted at all. His son Vasily met with Subotin and he refused to tell the group where they could find his father. Due to the Soviet Union's financial situation, Svechkov was more interested in keeping his own business alive. He worried if he left for an extended period of time, it would fail completely. The expedition was doomed from the start without Svechkov's funding. The group couldn't even rent a helicopter to take them near the crash site. So they eventually did get there. However, too much time had gone by since June 1992 and the UFO was gone. The military more than likely removed it sometime before 1998 but the markers left by the group of the second expedition were still there. The ground itself had been covered up by construction equipment, most likely to remove any sign of a crash. That's the crazy part about all of this though. Radar and pilots all saw the same thing, and the second expedition found the crash and detailed it. And after this disappointment though, the validity, that, that validity, validity of the second group's expedition was doubted obviously that was a hard word to say even if there was enough documentation from independent witnesses you know whether or not the story is true it's kind of fucking cool i'm not gonna lie i really wanted it to be more like a lot longer actually like they were so fucking close to getting something but they didn't obviously there's questions of why didn't they take pictures from farther away where the radiation didn't affect them and to that i say good question i don't know it is worth noting Nikolai Subutin and Emil Bakarin had also claimed to be involved in another similar story in 1989 in which a dogfight between UFOs was seen over the skies of Russia. This dogfight was witnessed by hundreds and was even reported on local newspaper. The similarities are that several witnesses saw a UFO in the sky, a UFO crash landed, although this time it was on a military test range that it had crashed. An airplane flying over the area had to abort its mission due to equipment malfunction. The military sent a team to the area on a rescue operation. He and fellow researchers reached the site only for the object to not be there anymore. I don't know man, he might, might have reused some details. Not 100% sure. You never know with these fucking UFO guys at all. It's honestly a cool story that I saw no one talk about on the internet, so I thought it was kind of cool for me to do it. I looked for as much as I could on it, to found almost nothing. I genuinely don't really know where the story even comes from. I found it on like one forum from like fucking 2004 or something. Anyways, I thought it was cool. I still think it's cool. Um, that's about it though. There's not much else to say. It's been a while since I've made something. Can you tell? Can you tell? With nothing else to say, I'm gonna just say a goodbye.